Thanks. Uh, so I hope you all had an interesting day today so far. Uh, for the next 45 minutes, I don't think it will be more engaging than the talks because I already saw a few hand raises and questions here and there. Uh, we will be discussing uh, challenges and opportunities within responsible and explainable AI, as well as ways in which we can sure ensure that AI is developed and used in a way that is transparent, accountable, and respectful to human rights. Our ex experts are both from the academic and the business fields, and they will share their insights and thoughts on this issue. So first I will do some short introductions, then we will discuss a few statements. And if you have any questions at all, keep them in your brain, save them till the end, because there will be a question round in which you will have the opportunity to actually ask your questions to our panel members. And with that being said, I would like to invite all panel members to the stage. So please welcome Leonie van Amersfoort, Sophia Zipman, Johan Kamp, and Hilde Weert. Welcome. So I will first do a short introduction into all of you that we know who we are actually dealing with today. So starting on your right <laughs> is Johan Kamp. She is a lecturer ICT and research moral design strategy at Fontes University of Applied Sciences. You are also a co-creator of the technology Impact Cycle Toolkit, <laughs> which is designed to make people think and make better decisions about technology. You were born into a teaching family and you try to ignore your roots for a certain amount of time, but now you are embracing your role as a lecturer. And you describe yourself as a non-tech nerd in a high-tech world. Welcome. <laughs> and next to you, we have Leonie. Leonie, you are a product owner and analytics translator at Vodafone Ziggo. Uh, you are happy when exercising a role with impact and showing your non-data colleagues the value of data. Um, in your spare time, you are a true star baker or meesterbakker for the Dutch people. <laughs> and you love to harvest your own vegetables from your own garden. Uh, thanks for joining us. And then we have Sophia. Sophia, you are a senior machine learning engineer at Engines. Uh, you get energy from projects which you can contribute to models to improve work and life for individuals. During the weekend, the sewing machine and the cocktail shaker can make an appearance at home, but you manage yourself never at the same time. <laughs> Seems like a wise decision. <laughs> Welcome, Sophia. And last but definitely not least is Hilde Weerts. Hilde, you are an artificial intelligence engineer at Eindhoven University of Technology. Your personal mission is to contribute to the use of machine learning in a responsible way and to prevent the least influential people to get screwed over, basically, while the bigger, more influential parties profit from technology. Uh, you describe yourself as a serial hobby hopper, <laughs> from making music to Krav Maga to embroidery, baking bread, basically anything goes. <laughs> Welcome, Hilde. So that, now that we know everyone shortly, I want to go back to the start and go back to Johan. Uh, so, back to the Impact Cycle Toolkit. You focus on using technology in a responsible manner. And I would like to ask you to actually tell the audience what it is that the Cycle Toolkit does, but also what you do as a lecturer, in short. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, as a lecturer in uh, IT, I saw that my students, most of the times, uh, just want to make some funky stuff. <laughs> Uh, and they do that and they think, uh, well, if all the technical parts are correct, if the bugs are out, if the, the, the product is looking fine, the buttons are on the, uh, the right spots, then I can launch it into society. And that was when we and a couple of colleagues thought, well, is this sustainable? Can we do this? Or ha do we have to think about the impact of this technology on society? And do we have to think about ethics? So we started with uh, philosophers. And we thought this is uh, quite interesting, and I think Hilde can, <laughs> can say something about that next. Uh <laughs> um, but it was not very practical for my kind of students. So we developed a, a toolkit with a lot of questions about the technical part of uh, technology, but also about the societal part of technology. 
example that basically already answers my question. <laughs> what are some issues within fair AI? And you already mentioned that uh, they need to look more at, for example, the ethics and not only the development and the deployment. And going to Hilda then, <laughs> you already made the bridge for me. Uh, Hilda, you have a similar mission. So you are a big advocate, as you told me, of using machine learning in a res responsible way. Uh, and for you the same, could you please tell everyone what it is that you do and also discuss what is an issue concerning fair AI that you see? Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm Hilde Weert. So I'm an AI engineer at Eindhoven University of Technology. And I do a lot of different things. Like I'm not just a serial hobby hopper, but also <laughs> in my work, I tend to take on a lot of different tasks. Uh, but I teach um, a bachelor's course on responsible AI uh, at the university. Um, I am also a maintainer of an open source software library called FairLearn, which is primarily aimed at um, fairness or machine learning. And I also uh, like to do research, uh, whenever all those other ta tasks uh <laughs> have been done. Uh, and there I really try to focus on uh, trying to take an interdisciplinary perspective uh, on machine learning. So my background is still primarily in computer science, um, but I make attempts at uh, collaborating with uh, ethicists, uh, legal experts, um, human technology interaction, all different types of uh, fields, because I really truly believe um, that's the only way in which we can actually uh, make things happen in the real world. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. Sounds, sounds very good what you're actually doing. Then, of course, you can't see them separately, explainable and responsible AI, but my assumption, what I got from everyone, is that the outside people, so Jan and Linda, are more that's on the <laughs> responsible AI, and Sophia and Leonie are more on the explainable AI. So if I could go to Leonie, could you also give a short introduction in the work that you do and maybe tell our audience what you do to make AI explainable? So how do you explain what is happening in the black box that is AI? Okay, yes, sure. Hi, I'm Leonie. Uh, I work as a product owner and analytics translator at Vodafone Ziggo and um, my team, I have six data scientists in my team and two big data engineers. And they also like to build cool stuff. <laughs> um, but my role is really to uh, get uh, the cool stuff uh, our way, the cool projects, but also talk to the business about what they really need, to ask the question behind the question, and make sure that the cool stuff that we build is actually used and implemented uh, by the business, is accepted by the business. The, the, the business users are engaged into really uh, using the, the numbers or the things that we make. Um, and analytics translation is a big part of that because uh, I'm like the bridge between the data scientists on the one hand and the business people on the other hand. Uh, and therefore we really need explainable AI because if we just provide them with the black box and the numbers, uh, my experience is that it's not gonna work. Uh, they're <laughs> not gonna accept it, they're not really gonna use it. Uh, I was just talking in the lunch time, that is the first time in, in years, uh, two weeks ago I got uh, a question, just give me the numbers. I said, no, sorry, we don't work like that. Um, so yeah, it's a really big part of my job to make sure that we, that people understand what we build and also we engage with the business continuously to make sure that we build something that they will actually use and understand. Sounds good, I'm actually impressed. <laughs> then moving on to Sophia, you are also a translator between the client and developer. Could you tell us a bit about your work at Engines and also how you translate what the developers do to the client? Because I can imagine that's pretty tough. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe just first what Engines does, because we're a small machine learning consultancy and highly specialized in operational AI. So really like putting it to use, putting it to practice way beyond the POC or the MVP. And um, what you say, indeed, I do translate, but that's because I speak both languages. I'm also an engineer myself. I know what it is to write those codes and I know uh, what it feels like to be misunderstood by the business. And uh, that's also where explainable AI comes in. I mean, the people who are familiar with the field most likely know about the techniques like the chef, the limes, the anchors, but just taking uh, all the other people, taking everyone who is uh, part of the process into account during the process so not just explaining the model, but also explaining the impacts of the model, explaining the data sources that the model runs on are all part of explainable AI. And uh, that is what I do, make sure that happens. 
I like the saying, I talk both languages. <laughs> okay, so I want to round up the introduction and move on to our first statement of the day, which is governance versus innovation. How can we regulate and promote innovation in AI? Because we know that AI is already used to solve a lot of complex problems, but we also know it doesn't come without any risk. So if we implement innovative AI into society, there's a high chance of job loss, breach of privacy, security issues, etc. Uh, but we do see that management and governance wants to push for fast development and fast employment because that's money, but they also have to keep in mind things like ethics and responsible AI. So my question is, is there a way that responsible and innovative AI can actually live side by side? However, before going to the panel members, because I always see that someone is eager to say something about it, uh, I first want to see what our audience thinks today. Um, so I would like to ask everyone to raise their hand if you agree with the statement, innovation is more important than regulation of standards like ethics and responsibility. Ooh. <laughs> I see, I see a few hands that actually think that innovation is more important than regulation. It's only one. <laughs> if you just uh, start thinking about what's not possible, then you cannot have innovation anymore. They were easy about the first. So please innovate, and then if you have 10 ideas, you can pack it, and then three will even fail. Yeah, I will. I don't know if everyone heard it, but I will repeat it. Uh, what, <laughs> what was said, if I was correct, is that we only think about the problems of innovating, basically, so, the, um, so that we look at the regulations, we stop innovating. So we can come up with 10 innovative ideas, then look at what is possible in terms of ethics and responsibility, and move on with the few innovations that are actually good for society, for example. Yeah, <laughs> perfect, thanks. Then I would like to actually ask Hilde about her opinion because she's <laughs> very eager. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I have many opinions that <laughs> I love to share. No. <laughs> um, so this, this statement really struck me a bit because it's kind of um, like the idea of innovation usually is that you progress to something, right? Um, but if you do not take into account any respons responsible aspects of that. Like, what are we progressing towards? And we, we already had a little conversation about that before, but like the, the, the big question is, what are you actually optimizing for? If we do not take into account ethics, is that a world that we would like to build? Like, I, I think, I can imagine that to some extent, um, it's good to have room, you know, to explore different ideas, but still, I believe in the core, um, we need to make sure that we take into account other values than just money. So. Okay, okay. And looking at that point, because, for example, we do have innovations, for example, the newborn uh, model from IBM, uh, they want to test it for ex during a pilot. When does the ethics come in? Because I can imagine that when building something new and innovative, you actually think there's an ethical part that's covered or the privacy is or the security is perfect, stuff like that. But at what point in the innovation is it important to actually look at it? Because you are saying you should look at it beforehand, yes. but there's also a big possibility that during innovation an issue comes in. Of course, yeah. Um, so indeed, like um, my first answer to the question would be already in you know, determining what problems we decide to tackle you're already making a value judgment, right? So that's already, to some extent, ethics, whether we would like to see it as that or not. Uh, but then along the way, I think like every step of the process, you should take into account ethics, like starting from the problem formulation, starting from defining like what are the key performance indicators, translating those to technical metrics, et cetera, et cetera, like the whole, uh, the whole process. So it's um, not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and I think, Johan, you want to yeah. 
Yeah, I totally share the agree. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason that, that we called our cycle tool a cycle tool. <laughs> so you can come back again uh, during the process of designing because then you'd still have time to change something. So I see ethics as uh, a practical way of doing uh, innovation with ethics within. So if you, don't, if you only do eti the ethical part at the end, that's uh, sometimes the case um, in companies I know, then, uh, then the product is almost finished. And if you go to a privacy officer or a chief ethical officer only then, then you don't have time to change the product. Uh, and when what Hilde says, you take it into the process and you ask these kind of questions in the beginning, in the middle of the process and in the end, then you have time to change your product for the good. So I think that's, uh, that might be a part of a solution. Yeah, maybe, maybe quickly to add, like, it's of course very easy for me to say this as an academic, right? You should all be incorporating ethics in every step, step of the way, <laughs> but of course, like, in practice, like I do need to acknowledge that it's not that he's even advocating for particular resources within your company to, to actually make, make sure that, you, that you, uh, you get the things that you need to do this. That's like a huge question that I think is very often ignored uh, in, the, on, in the academic side, like in the academic uh, yeah. discourse. So yeah, definitely. Well, I wanted to go to Leonie because yeah. you are on the business side. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I can just add an example of how we at Photophone Ziggo uh, do this. We have a privacy office that we uh, talk to uh, when we want to start building a model or using data for analysis purposes. Um, and we can actually get um, uh, a go-ahead in stages. So we can get a go-ahead for just researching and seeing if there's something there. So for kind of investigating the innovation part and then at some point, okay, this is maybe a good idea. This is what business value is there for us. This is what the impact on the customer side would be. And then we have to go to the privacy office again to get a go, no go for using it in really building the model and using it in practice and implementing it. So um, we can have different stages and depends really on the kind of topic that we talk about, on the model that we want to. Is it used for service purposes or for more commercial side of things? That really depends, but we can have different stages of, of go-aheads. Yeah. That would actually be kind of like the, the cycle I can yeah. imagine. So it's basically ethics in a scrum, agile manner. Sort of. Yeah. Okay, okay. And Sophia, you work, I can imagine, at a bit of a smaller company than Vodafone Sego. Do you also have these steps of actually... Well, uh, I work for a variety of companies, variety of clients. Uh, some the size of Vodafone Sego, some significantly smaller. And it really differs per company. It really differs per use case. Because, uh, let me be honest, sometimes we just have this uh, use case where no personal data is involved, uh, human impacts very little just more of a mechanical optimization we're doing. I think is really not really a big part of the project. But once you get to human impact, of course, it becomes a thing. And uh, what I think is interesting there, kind of the way you raised the statement at the beginning, uh, sometimes, uh, especially in maybe some sort of more conservative industries, ethics can be seen as something that is holding you back. And it can be seen as something that is annoying. And sometimes, you know, you have this privacy officer that talks a different language, and then you, you had this brilliant plan as a data scientist, and you can't go through with it. Uh, but just like Hilda said, in the end, you're optimizing for something. And both the ethics and the innovation are working towards that. So I really see it as a, a, a case where you have to manage everything, like all stakeholders involved properly and really let them see the value of it. Because uh, in the end, companies, they don't also don't want to make mistakes, especially not when it's like human impact, right? Because yeah. I mean, nobody wants a headline with, with their name and uh, saying, oh, they did this, this, this and this. Um, so I think it's really, uh, we should get rid of that, that notion that, you know, that regulation is holding you back. And I think when that mind shift starts to happen, it's also way easier to implement uh, AI solutions way faster, yeah. Okay, okay, so concluding from all the opinions is that we should keep regulating, but it shouldn't get in the way of innovation. So we should keep track of it, and maybe after every step of the way, we should talk to a privacy, or of privacy officer or anyone that can tell us something about the ethics. Then I would like to park this statement because we have one other statement, which is bias versus inclusion. Well, we all know that in AI there is bias. 
uh, especially when it comes to human data. For example, I read somewhere that uh, Netflix actually so shows different recommendations to women compared to men. Uh, ChatGPT has a left liberal worldview, but also AI hiring systems actually take into account certain parameters of the applicant that aren't even relevant to the performance of this person. So my question is, is there a way that we can actually ensure that AI is fair and takes into account diversity and inclusion? And with that, I would again like to ask everyone to raise their hands if you agree with the statement, AI will never completely be unbiased because it is in humans to be biased. <laughs> That's a lot of hands. <laughs> That was actually what I was expecting. <laughs> so I also saw, I think, almost all the hands raised from our panel members. Uh, going to Leonie, starting with you. Um, do you agree as well that uh, we can't really create unbiased AI because it's in human nature, it's already within the society? Yes, I do. I think you can try to collect as much diversity in data and also in the people that are building models uh, to, to limit it as much as possible, but I think you can never not have bias. And is there a way that we can limit the bias? How would you do this? Well, I prefer diverse team, yeah. so uh, uh, both female and males in my team, but also I have people from the Netherlands and people from outside the Netherlands. Um, uh, with different kind of backgrounds, some in software engineering, some in data science. Um, we try to combine that and also if I have discussions with the business, of course they have a different background because they are not in data. Um, uh, but we try to make sure that we have a lot of different voices at the table. Um, but still then, even with good intentions, bias or even GDPR issues can arise. Um, just because you, well, you have to challenge each other on it. Yeah, you, or everybody have to have the best ideas and the, and the goodwill to, to do things. It happens. Yeah. And Johan, do you see certain examples within, for example, your students, where they don't take to into account bias within natural data? Um, well, they tend to overlook bias uh, because they are in a bubble of typically uh, people from 20 to 28 years, so they typically see that as, uh, as a user perspective. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to uh, have more people engaged, more people from other backgrounds and other uh, countries, um, other age groups also. Might give you some very good insights if you ask your neighbor who is not very digital savvy. Um, but if you see the data perspective, there's something else. I think uh, we should see this problem as an ecosystem problem because um, it's also, data is al always about history. It's historical data that you uh, predict the future with. That's something different than saying what kind of future do we want to have and then scale the data upon that predicted future. So that might be an issue also. Um, and it's very difficult to know, but to give you an, in, uh, an, an example, um, some of the women here might get less um, invites for a new job than your male um, uh, peers. Uh, and you, you can say that's, that's bias, that's, uh, that's a problem. It can also be that targeting women of your age is more expensive on Instagram or LinkedIn than targeting men of the same age. And that's not because of the, um, uh, the way that the, the target group is uh, for uh, labor, but that is because uh, a lot of cosmetic products are sold to young women. So that market is, is so big that it influences other things in society. So I think we should look at the whole ecosystem and everything that's Uh, surrounding it to, to tackle the problems, and that might be quite difficult. <laughs> okay, so we should change the historical data to make sure that what comes out of an AI model isn't biased? Is that the correct takeaway? <laughs> <laughs> we should change the data into what we want for society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. 
Hilda? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a difficult question, of course, but um, like, of course, uh, it would be weird to say that there is no systemic um, differences in society right now, right? Along many different dimensions. Um, so, of course, that type of biases, like bias is a very broad term, so it could mean many different things, but let's just say that we talk about that type of bias. Um, we cannot, like as data scientists, we might want to change the world immediately, but it would be very difficult to do that just within the context of a single, a single project, of course. Um, but I do think that on a broader scale, if there's more voices uh, raising, uh, uh, raising these types of issues, that we can also make changes, not just to the models that we're building, but also to the society that we are actually living in, right? Um, and there, one thing that I do think is quite interesting is how um, the biases that we see in machine learning models um, and the type of results that they produce, it also, it, it's also kind of like a mirror, right? So even if, you're, if you have a, a machine learning model that's, uh, I don't know, selecting only male candidates instead of female candidates, probably that was already happening in the first place even before you created your machine learning model, right? So I think we can also see this, this as an opportunity to kind of face <laughs> the biases that we have and then together try to, try to tackle them. And that's very difficult in the context of one uh, machine learning model, of course. Um, but in addition to that, I would like to say that there's also a bunch of different biases that you really can counteract if you're aware of them. Um, so you have like the more broader societal aspect, but there's also issues with like, I don't know, like specifically how you collect particular data can have a huge effect. And if you're just aware of that, and for example, learn from um, like in social sciences, when they collect data, they really pay, pay attention to what are we actually measuring. So we can learn from those types of sciences again um, to, uh, yeah, to, to make the machine learning model uh, development better as well. And also from other ones, but let me give the mark to the next person, because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to turn into lecture mode. So You've got to talk about it for hours. <laughs> so for, yeah, do you also see that there, it kind of works as a mirror, these bias models? Because I really like uh, that analogy that it's more like a mirror and that's actually an opportunity to work on the bias. Do you see that as well? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, the thing, like in, in my work, especially like from the consulting side, right, I'm, I'm I was optimizing for something, and sometimes when it has a very high human impact, you want to be aware of certain biases, and you might want to correct for them. But I, what I also feel is interesting in that field is uh, what we as a society deem to be a desirable outcome. Because sometimes we say we don't want bias, right? It's really easy to say we don't want bias. But I mean, look at the audience here. We're pretty biased and that's kind of on purpose. <laughs> so, um, and I think it's a, it's a continuous discussion and I think that will change over time. Because I mean, if you looked at like what was, uh, what was okay, ex will be accepted from like a machine learning, even though we didn't have the machine learning we have now like 50 years ago, well, it will be so totally different. And I think it's gonna be different like 50 years from now as well. And I think we should keep that into account when designing and working on AI s solutions and systems now as well. That what we now maybe think is okay or not okay might change in the future. And uh, that brings a whole lot of different challenges, like to the process, the way you store your data, the way you store your models, the infrastructure, and all the technical shebang that goes around it. Um, yeah, makes it more difficult, makes it more interesting, makes our work more valuable in the end. Definitely, yeah. So it takes time, and maybe in 10 years, your answer will be different. Who knows? Yeah, well, it <laughs> will be interesting, right? I mean, I hope so. We'll get back to that <laughs> in 10 years. So I'm going to move on because we are actually running out of time and I did promise everyone that you could also engage in the panel discussion. Are there people that already have some questions for one of our panel members concerning responsible and explainable AI? It's not scary. Any question goes. Oh, all the way. <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, wow, this is scary. <laughs> yeah, so I have a question uh, for all of you, actually. It's like just a general question. What do you think about the AI Act from European Commission? Like how it will change AI world in Europe? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I start? Uh, I'm, I'm part of a working group at, at IBM, of course. Uh, 
that we are working on this, we are trying to prepare our solutions for this, and we are a bit like struggling to figure out where to start, so. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess we're also uh, taking baby steps and in the beginning of what that would mean for us, but I think in general it will uh, increase the importance of explainable AI. You have to be able to tell others in a analytics translated sort of way uh, what the model does and what the impact is, what data is used and everything. So I think it's mainly uh, our focus to make sure that explainable AI gets even more important role in the work that we do. Yeah, I think so uh, too. What I think, uh, like, first of all, I'm happy that we got regulation on it. Like, it might not be the perfect regulation. I don't think it is the perfect regulation yet. But I mean, just like models, uh, regulation can be iterative. Um, what I do find to be particularly interested in it, though, that a lot of people say we need explainable AI. Like, explainability is very important, but then the actual definition of explainable is lacking. And I totally understand that, because I mean, even within the, the academic field of explainable AI, it's, it, it's still trying, you know, it's, it's still figuring out itself. So how can we expect lawmakers to know what it is? Um, and I think that is also that comes with like the more and more applications we have, the more and more it gets into our real life, we'll have some error, unfortunately, but I think that's part of the process. Uh, but then we should like, keep the debate on going like when is something explainable and to whom it should be explainable and how we can actually facilitate that. And I think it's, yeah, it's just interesting from the AI Act itself that we all say we want it, but nobody exactly knows what we want. <laughs> and um, yeah, I hope to see that change too. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, all yeah, the way sure. in the back. <laughs> Are there any other questions for our panel members? They are very nice, so they will give a nice answer. <laughs> All the way on the right. Yeah. <laughs> We're giving you a workout, Roos. Yeah, no <laughs> I swam this morning, actually. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, so I've got a specific question for Sophia. So, as a data science consultancy company, do you ever face uh, like a conflict of interest where you would like to do the ethically right thing, but then pointing out something which is wrong in the pipeline of your actual customer might actually like hurt your sales? So could you um, comment on that? Well, um, I never have been like in such a situation like personally myself, I'd, and I don't, to be honest, don't know of any like direct colleagues who have been. But I can imagine in such a scenario, uh, I want to be confident that the work I give is there like to stay. That's also what we sell. We don't sell short-term solutions. And if you want to do something uh, unethically, I think at a certain point in time, it will come out. And um, that's not something I want. That's not something I want my name to be connected with. So I think in that case, of course, uh, you'll try your best to explain why it is important and why you should do it. And if there really is this, this conflict of interest and there's really no way I can guarantee the quality I stand by, then I simply don't. And then you, know, you can say, well, that's very, uh, but of course, if you've got a lot of money, that's not what you're gonna do. But I think um, that's only optimizing for the short term because in the long term, we still wanna make that money. And yeah, we don't want something like that to happen. Well, interesting question for sure, yeah. All right, good question. Any other questions? I have time for one final question. <laughs> In the front, we have one, and also in the middle. <laughs> yeah, you get to choose. So. Well, if they are short ones, we can fit them in both. Yeah, <laughs> so, yes. uh, yeah definitely. <laughs> Don't ask it. A so my question <laughs> is quite simple. It was also uh, addressed in the beginning. Innovation versus regulation, right? If you look to the US, they probably have a lot less regulation. We also have way more innovation than we do here, especially around AI. Mm. And what's your feeling about this? Because in the EU, we just have more regulation. Maybe it's good, right? We I think everybody almost raised their hand, so I think it was quite, quite clear, but might hinder innovation. I don't know, how happy are you with some of the innovation that is going on <laughs> in the US? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure uh, all of that no, is no. for the better. Uh, but the there are also run. good things, right? Of course, but it's not like, yeah. Um, I, it's hard to say because we don't have the counterfactual, right? <laughs> if they would have, maybe, maybe they're just super innovative by nature, you know? It's a, it's a bit hard to answer, but... Um, yeah, in, in, in my view, it's still, I, what I really like, and I think the GDPR is actually a great example of that, is that you can see that regulation, even when it's not perfect, like GDPR, there's many issues with that, but you can really see how it has changed 
the data landscape over the past few years, not only, not only in the European Union, but also across other uh, places, especially also in the US. So I really do hope that the AI Act, even though it's definitely not perfect, <laughs> and I have opinions about that as well, but um, <laughs> that, uh, that it can also, I don't know, just uh, give a good example. Let's just put it like that. If I can give a short business point of view, what we try to do is um, build the innovative innovative ideas, uh, build them and do research beforehand and then go to both our privacy office and our uh, uh, business partners to say, okay, we think this is a good idea, we can show it with numbers, but we need more data to really get it and then we get consent from our customers to use their data. So we're thinking in different ways of, okay, um, how can we ask the customer for more data what do we propose for them, what's in it for them to make sure that they understand what they're saying yes to. But those are kind of thoughts that we are having into getting more data that is a little bit more sensitive, but also make sure that we can keep innovating in, in uh, well, creating better customer experience for our uh, customers. Yeah. Maybe to add a little bit to that, I really love <laughs> your example because the, um, what, I, what I like about it is that you emphasize uh, more the idea behind the law and then the questions that it raises, rather than like seeing it as just a compliance checklist, which I think is amazing, so good job. Thanks. <laughs> Real quick, in the middle. Should I throw it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question is whether the panelists believe that explainable AI is really necessarily necessary for the development of responsible AI. So I can imagine in the future when we maybe get better at evaluating systems beyond simple performance metrics, but also looking at human machine task performance, quantifying fairness and biases. Is it in that stage, do you believe explainability is a necessity for responsible AI or do you see a future where we can go without explainability? Ooh, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I do have two little anecdotes. Uh, I think generally speaking, yes, it's a necessity because uh, I see that in projects as well, a lot of the machine learning applications we make are there to support humans, and then uh, the entire system benefits from an explainer that is tailored towards those users. Uh, but we once also had a project where we had a, we faced a lot of uh, resistance from the people where, where the machine learning model was supposed to help them. Uh, a lot of management, uh, an explainer for them as well. And they used the explainer very intensively at the beginning. And then at a certain point, they were like, okay, I, I trust the model. And then they just never looked at the explainer because the trust was there. So I think there are certain use cases where uh, it's more present in certain parts of the process for sure. But I think generally speaking, yeah, of course, of course we need it. I mean, look at the, the colleagues you're working with, right? How often do you ask them why they did what they did? And I think you want to do the same with systems that are working with you. <laughs> no, I, so, uh, I, I think generally, I definitely think that, but I, I, I do really like the question, because I think that um, to some extent, like explainability is more of a means towards a particular end, and I think that's also a little bit what you were pointing towards. Like, if you have a super nicely organized model validation procedure where you do thorough checking, testing, testing, testing in the real world, like really like, I don't know, like what they do with medicines uh, in, in healthcare, for example, in some cases, they also don't know exactly why a medicine works, um, but you can still test very thoroughly that it actually works. So for AI systems, you could imagine that in some cases, maybe explainability itself is more like um, a way to do that validation, but it's not the only way, right? You can, you can also, but I do definitely agree, like once humans are involved that need to make decisions or et cetera, then of course it's, it's very, uh, very important, but um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, what we certainly want to avoid is uh, a system that says no. So I uh, think keeping the human in the loop, like the first uh, speaker of today said, uh, like AI and humans working together, uh, and then the human can explain why the system says no, <laughs> might be uh, a good thing. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay, well, thanks for everyone in the audience for engaging. And I have one final question. Keep it short because we already ran out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, for each panel member, do you have a take-home message, P 
piece of advice for our audience? Keep it short, Hilda. <laughs> Why do I have to start? Uh, let's see. Uh, we already touched upon the worlds we want to build. Maybe, maybe um, one thing that I would like, because this is a room mostly full of data scientists, um, and I would really like to encourage you to also talk to other disciplines and try to take them seriously. So in some cases, it can be very tempting to be like when you are talking to a lawyer, to a lawyer and they say, blah, 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 and it, it just you're like, that's not how machine learning works. Try to take the time to explain to them how it does work instead of immediately thinking this person doesn't have expertise on this topic. And instead, like, really try to engage with other people. So that's my... Thank you. Um, I think mine is, is that sometimes within the world, we're live, we work in a very technical field, a very technical line of work, and sometimes I feel we have the tendency to forget the user, to forget the human side. I feel there's a lot of emphasis on that today, but I still uh, would like to see that more. Uh, in the end, we're doing it to improve our world uh, for all the people and other beings living on here. Um, so keep so keep that in mind. We're not up <laughs> at plant flowers. We're, we're we're not optimizing for an accuracy. We optimize for the for the world we live in, and uh, yeah, that should always be the goal. Yeah, I can only add to that. I was thinking the same. Also from the the first speaker we had this morning, it's. It's about the team, it's about different type of people that engage in working with the AI, the users, the data scientists, the, the business people. Uh, please make sure that you connect with everybody so uh, the, the cool things that you make actually land somewhere and uh, can get roots instead of just being put in a shelf. Yeah, I can only add to <laughs> this. <laughs> I think the non-technical people should not be scared of uh, technology and the technical people should not be scared to explain to non-technical people what they are doing. Well, that's a perfect way of saying it, actually. <laughs> well, with that, I would like to end this panel discussion and also thank all our panel members for engaging, thank the audience for participation, and finally, I know they are already coming, but thank the organization <laughs> of women <laughs> in data science. <laughs>